Hello, Money Monday audience, and thank you for joining us today. Today on our segment, we have Thomas J. Canale, a wealth management advisor. Tom has built his practice by specializing in working with business owners, self-employed professionals, and families that have children with special needs. Tom has obtained his securities license, six, seven, nine, 10, 63, and 65 which have allowed him to share his knowledge and help his clients obtain financial security. In addition, Tom uses his expertise to teach a CFP course at Northwestern University here in Chicago. Tom is also the founder of the Canali Financial Group, focused on helping you achieve financial security for your family and business. Welcome to the segment, Tom Canali. Hi, Tom. Hi, Jill. How are you today? Great. Thanks yourself? for coming on our segment. So can you tell our Money Monday audience, what is a financial planner and a wealth manager? What do you do? I think we need to simplify and demystify what a planner is. Okay. We help coach behavior of what people should do with their money to be in alignment with the values they have. Okay. Because oftentimes I recognize values are one way and the actions are another. Okay. So that's, that's really what I'm doing. Okay. And so if a person wanted to engage with a financial planner, how do they even begin the process? I think most clients or even some of our audience that may be watching, many right. of them may not have planners. Right. Right. That's a good question. Let's start there. What percentage of people actually have a financial planner? Well, as a professional that's paid, probably the minority of the population. Really? But they might have their father or their uncle or their friend who is their planner, quote unquote, mm -hmm. or the individual who sells the 401k to their firm that's their planner. So I think the majority from all studies I've seen is that about 3% of the population wow. use a certified financial planner. Why is that? I think it's scary for people. I think it's uh, admitting maybe things have not been done and the perception that they're going to be judged, mm -hmm. when in reality that doesn't happen with a good professional. Okay. But I think money is also something that we were taught to be private about when we're young and yeah. in our culture. I know in my family, we didn't talk about money at Thanksgiving dinner or birthdays. So that's one of the elements that's also working against us. But yeah. I think as people become more independent mm -hmm. in society and are not living with their parents, they've got to handle their own money. That's and good. And slowly they're learning what to do with it. That's good to know. And so specifically for the person who's interested in engaging or even wanting a relationship with the financial planner, how do they begin that process? Sure. I think the best thing is to obtain a referral. Okay. If it was me and I was looking for someone in my field, I would go to three people that I love and ask who they've used as a planner and start there. Then the second thing I would do is I would research mm -hmm. the individual. I mean, the World Wide Web is powerful. Yeah. If someone researched me, they'd see that I'm involved in things with my children or my life. And to see the human, I think is helpful too. And okay. it breaks down the barrier of walking into a scary office. Mm -hmm. And the third thing I would do is test the relationship. Got it. You have to go have a conversation to see how it actually was. Okay. Is in our mind, it's maybe more challenging ahead of time. And when we leave, people say, that wasn't so bad. Got it. So I think those three things. So there's really not no one, there's not a one size fit all. Absolutely. It's like you really have to make the relationship and make sure it's a good fit. Yes. Okay. This is a mutually beneficial relationship, like your physician mm -hmm. or a dentist. It's a professional you have to trust, which is the most important ingredient. And then too, you have to hit it off. Yeah. I think you have to have mutual respect That's good. to work in a relationship for a long time. That's good to know. And so what are some foundational things that people should think about when it comes to the financial planning process? I think foundationally, I'd like to use a picture if I can. Okay. So not everyone lives in a home, but I think we can understand the concept of how a home is built, mm -hmm. right? You're going to have a home built today. You have a foundation that's laid, okay. literally cement and it has to cure, mm -hmm. and then the home is built on top of it. Okay. And the inspector comes in before that home is resided in and says, the home is safe, we can live here. So I use that analogy with financial planning and I've done so for 25 years. And here's what I think. I think a foundation mm -hmm. is number one based on good values that you actually care about yourself or someone else yes. and want to make good decisions with yeah. your money. The actual components of that foundation would be the emergency fund. Have your parents, Jill, ever told you you should have three to six months expenses in the bank? Never. No? Never. Okay, well, now you know. So now forever you carry forward that opportunity and the responsibility to have some money in the bank. Yeah. Because things happen. People lose employment, people get sick, so having money in the bank is key. Mm -hmm. The second component or foundation is starting an insurance program early in life before you need the insurance. Okay. You know, as we get older, we have more people that we love in our families and responsibilities, but 
as our health changes, insurance is harder to buy. Okay. So I like to tell people to think about their foundation as early as possible for life insurance, disability insurance, and health insurance. And those are three things ideally people accomplish in their early 20s. Really? So you know what? I just want to have a very transparent moment for those of you who are watching our Money Monday audience today. Um, Mr. Canale actually was my instructor at Northwestern University. Um, I met him, knew nothing about money, and after sitting in his class, it absolutely, absolutely just warped my world. And I had a conversation with him, and I told him, I was like, I'm going to be very transparent with you. I haven't created a budget. I haven't started the financial planning process. I need you to kind of walk me through this thing, but I want to feel comfortable with the person because I'm going to be sharing some sensitive information and so that fear that he talked about you may be a Money Monday audience similar to myself where when you're actually beginning the process now or maybe you've never started the process like I did and you're like how do I begin this process he's telling you some very key things do your research find someone that you're comfortable with for me, I didn't have those three people that he talked about in my family. And fortunate enough, I sat in a classroom and met someone like him where I trusted the relationship and now he's actually putting me on straight street and helping me create that foundation that I need in order to begin the wealth building process. But thinking about wealth, Tom, can you talk about how sometimes people want to jump in the ocean and go directly to wealth, but they haven't laid that foundation? Right. I don't even think that they even know how to lay that foundation. And so there was a slide that you wanted us to display, right? Yes. And so can you talk a bit about what this slide looks like? Take a look, guys. So as you think about the house, the foundation that I just articulated would be unseen, underground, dirty, things people don't want to deal with, but are so critical for you to get to Straight Street, mm -hmm. okay. including cash in the bank for three to six months expenses. I lose my job. Mm -hmm. My son gets sick. Things happen. People are unprepared for emergencies. And not that we don't know that they're coming. We don't want them to happen. Mm -hmm. We just don't know when they're coming. Yeah. The second thing is thinking through insurance. And insurance is a friend of ours. Insurance is not a foe. No one likes paying for it, but it's there when you need it. Yeah. And it's at the time you need it most. It's cash. So whether it's because you've passed or mm -hmm. someone you love has passed, life insurance is critical. It's underestimated as to when we should buy it. If we only knew our health in advance, this would be easy. Yes. The same thing for health insurance or disability insurance. Those are all the foundations that are critical to be laid early in life when we're healthiest. And insurance is based on your age in the form of its price. So we're only going to pay more money if we wait to buy it when we're older. Foundation laid. That might take $100 a month, maybe, to lay that foundation. I wow. think that's a surprise for most people. Yeah. Do you think it would normally be more expensive than that? I would have thought it would have been way more expensive right. than that. Not at all. It's a function of time and budget as to how much you can do. But I've helped people lay a budget and a foundation for $44 a month. So it doesn't have to be overwhelming. Got it. Then we start to build. And as you said, get me on straight street. And the way we build is by doing a budget. Okay. And it is the most challenging topic to work with families over the 25 years I've been doing this to budget. Okay. When they didn't start budgeting at the beginning. That's challenging. So, Tom, is this more of the foundational piece or is this our second layer to our home? Budgeting is really both. It's foundational and that people have an interest in budgeting. But then as we begin to lay that second layer of our home, actually doing the budgeting okay. and monitoring cash flow. Okay. And that's what allows us to determine if we should be saving money or paying down debt. And I think oftentimes those are in conflict. Okay. And so let's talk about the different roles that you have. So there's this financial planner part, and then we also know that you're a wealth manager. Right. And so do those clients look different? They don't. The clients that have actually gone through the first few steps and laid a foundation, yes. optimize their budget to identify what debt they pay down and where they start to save, okay. can then start to grow their wealth. Wealth doesn't start once you've had $100,000. Wealth starts at $25 a month and saving it for a very long period of time so that the money can grow. I think oftentimes, Jill, people wait till they think they have enough money to have a conversation, then it's too late. It's too late. 
Yeah, that's good to know. Well, you know what, it's the summertime now, and there are a lot of college students who are maybe coming home for the summer, or even high school students that are just graduating now. What bit of information, or how would you assist that person with beginning the financial planning process? Interesting you asked that. I remember with my first job, I was caddying at a golf club not too far from here, right down Des Plaines Avenue at Riverside Golf Club. <laughs> really? And I would walk home with cash every day, and I felt like I was wealthy. But what's interesting is by the time I got home, I had bought some candy bars, and I had bought some Cokes, and I had less money, and I instantly thought I should spend first. Got it. The principle that my parents taught me was to save first. Mm -hmm. And ideally, if I can work with an individual and communicate through this message today, one thing, it would be to begin saving 20% of your pay from your first job. And if that's in high school, great. If it's in college, great. If it's after graduate school, great. No one on the planet has ever run out of money when they've saved 20% of what they've made from the beginning. Wow. That'd be my biggest message. And so it, would you say that this is just for the person who's just starting working, or would you also recommend that for someone like myself? I think it's challenging if someone's mid-career to suddenly start to save 20%. It's almost as if you get on a treadmill and you get on at seven miles an hour. I know, That's right? That's hard, <laughs> yeah. right? That causes yeah. scrapes and bumps and bruises. Yeah. But I think to get on the treadmill and maybe go a mile and a half, then three miles an hour, then gauge it to five and seven. Individuals run at different paces. Okay. So I think it's realistic at the beginning before anyone knows about expenses to save at 20%. Got it. And that's a goal we have in our career to get to 20% if I meet someone midstream in life. That's good to know. And so Tom, there's a second slide that you have here. Can you tell our audience about this slide in particular and about the saving process? Sure. I think the second slide depicts a dollar bill nicely, and I don't know that I necessarily drew the line on this dollar bill at 20% is saved, but I gave you the image that it's not 0%. Yes. I definitely have a notable piece of the puzzle that's saved. And what has work, really worked well for the families I serve is the following rule of three. Let's save 20% of our pay and pay ourselves first. Okay. Truly pay ourselves first and save that and fill up an emergency bucket so that we have three to six months expenses in cash. That is the hardest thing I've had to deal with with clients because yeah. we see the money there and we can spend it. Yes. But it takes a long time to save it. Yes. We can spend with our thumb these days what we've worked for for 40 years. Yeah. That's dangerous. So paying ourselves first is key, the first mm -hmm. 20%. Then if we think through the second part of three, spend 60% of your pay on fixed expenses. The third part of your pay, take 20% of your pay towards discretionary expenses. Okay. If you do them in that order, the 20% savings takes place first. Okay. And then think through the fact that we don't want everything we've saved in our lifetime in a bank account. That's true. Right? And the reason we wouldn't want that is we don't get much interest. That's true. Money doesn't grow. It's stagnates. Sitting in a bank account. That's right. true. It's, it's a good problem to have though. <laughs> right, we have the money. I know. But then I visually explained this picture by having a short term bucket, a medium term bucket, and a long term bucket. So as we sit here today, Jill, mm -hmm. short term might be the next one to three years. You might have goals in life to accomplish for people that you love yeah. or yourself, things that matter. And that's why I mentioned earlier your values drive your decisions. Then you might have some decisions that are to be made today but experienced in 10 to 15 years. That could be a woman who just had a baby yes. and she wants to send her little one off to private high school. That's 12 years away. Well, private high school can be expensive mm -hmm. and people are better off saving for it, let alone college, 18 to 20 years away, yeah. which are significant expenses for people and investments. And then lastly, as we get older, some people like to know they don't have to work forever and choose to have money and volunteer at their church or teach kids mm. something meaningful so they can retire. You know, Tom, you brought out so many points. I had a slew of questions coming through that I wanted to ask you at every step of the way. There was one particular piece that you brought out. You talked about the college savings process. And so there may be parents who are, who have children that are maybe now in grammar school and they're thinking maybe long term about the college process. What recommendations would you give that person as to how they can begin that planning process? Well, I would share one perspective that I have bias around. And I'm going to use an example that we're on an airplane and you and I are in coach. Okay. We're in the back 
and the flight attendant comes and she makes a presentation or he makes a presentation that if we're reaching turbulence up or down, oxygen masks might fall out of the sky. Yes. Uh, excuse me, out of the top of the airplane, yeah. right? Yeah. And what happens is they tell you to put it on yourself first so you can serve the person next to you. Yeah. So now, as I say that, I think many parents realize that their children may be more important to be fed first at dinner. But the spirit of your question, I think people should be saving for their retirement first because it could be a very long period of time and they might impact their children negatively. Yeah. Then if they have the cash flow to save for their daughter or son's college experience, so be it. And it's never too late. That's good. They, their daughter could be in high school. That's never good. Never too late. But I would really make sure they understand the family's impacted favorably mm -hmm. if they've saved for themselves first. That's good. So moral of the story, make sure you put your oxygen mask on first before trying to save everyone else. Question, there may be someone who may be watching and maybe they're in debt. So we know that debt right now is huge. Most families have large amounts of debt. And before, well, backing up a bit, we talked about fear being one of the factors why most people start. But sometimes it could just be realistic things that are happening where they're drowning in debt. So what do you do and how do you help that person get to a place where they can even start a foundation? Great question. Fundamentally, the most important thing is that the person addresses the issue and we have a conversation. That's where the solutions begin. Yeah. Avoidance behavior is usually what I see and I'm not a psychologist. I don't have those credentials. But you coach behavior. I try to, <laughs> but what's interesting is I have to be willing to be coached. coached. So yeah. it's, you know, pupil or teacher, yeah. which comes first. The person has to really be honest and say to myself, I don't know enough about mm -hmm. this. I need some help. So reach out a hand and you'll be surprised someone will be there to help you. So that's my first message. The second is it's never too late relative mm -hmm. to debt. And I think there's great debt and I think there's expensive debt. Great debt would be investing in yourself. Yeah. An education, undergraduate, graduate, what have you, a home. That's great debt. And the reason it's also great debt is mm -hmm. the interest rates generally low. Okay. Then we have expensive debt. And expensive debt would be credit card debt, which is typically a symbol that shows us we didn't have yeah. the three to six months expenses in the bank. Yes. And an emergency happened and we had to borrow. Mm -hmm. Those interest rates are exorbitant, Jill, oftentimes. There are the 0% promos that are out there, but if you read the fine details, fine print, 12 months later, yeah. you're at 19%. So I think the most important thing is addressing it, building a game plan and a timeline, mm -hmm. and realizing you can't just pray overnight and it goes away. Yeah. You have to address it and build a game plan. That's good. That's good to know. And it kind of brings back another question I have for you. So what about, would you ever recommend a client have a bankruptcy? Or what are some um, thinking, those that may be thinking about bankruptcy, how do you handle a client in that particular situation? Absolutely. Bankruptcy exists because it's appropriate and the government recognizes it's a strategy that should be used when necessary. And there are different degrees of bankruptcy in Chapter 7, 11, 13. What's interesting is most people don't know there's a difference in the type of bankruptcy and the potential to obtain credit can be challenging down the road. There are certain things that cannot be wiped away in bankruptcy. There are certain things that can be. Sitting down with the proper bankruptcy attorney is typically someone's best bet. Can you actually talk a bit about bankruptcy? Can you talk about what's the difference between chapter seven and 13? Uh, not being an attorney, I wanna be careful what I share about bankruptcy, but what I can tell you is the higher the number, the more extreme the bankruptcy. Seven, 11, 13 as an example. Okay. Assets can be acquired if you provide yourself the opportunity to go bankrupt and claim bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So one of the risks of bankruptcy is not only losing out on the opportunity to borrow money in the future, but you also might lose some assets you have. Okay. So it's a real, really good conversation with an attorney who has expertise in this daily, mm -hmm. but I do have many clients that have experienced that in their lifetime, and they've come back and jumped on the horse again and started saving. That's good. And they've built their life from there forward. That's so it's good. not been something that's been so disabling, Jill, where they can't progress forward. Well, you know what, Tom, I think in our conversation, you've done a lot of foundational digging. I feel dug out a bit, <laughs> a bit. And so I think you've laid a good foundation here. And so as we're building this house up, how do you begin to get to a person to a place of growth? And so everybody's looking like, well, I just wanna invest. 
So let's say they've laid their foundation, they've covered those four major areas where they have their insurance in place, yes. they've thought about disability insurance, they have their budget in place, and now there's a substantial amount of cash flow that's coming in the home. How do we get to a place of growth where now our money is working for us? Then that's awesome because we've arrived. Okay. So now got our foundation laid, like you said. As we think about growing wealth, I think one of the most notable aspects is the time horizon we have before we need the money. Okay. So for example, I have an 11 year old. We're gonna need money for school, hypothetically seven to 10 years from now. That time horizon's different than his younger brother okay. who will need money 13 to 15 years from now. Okay. So theoretically, time horizon's often misunderstood. It's not just the beginning of when you need money, it's how long you'll need it thereafter. So education could be four to six years, retirement could be 40 years. So thinking through time horizons, aspect number one for growth. Okay. The second aspect for growth would be affordability. If we can work within our 20-60-20 rule, remember, pay yourself first 20%. Yes. If we have our emergency funds, we theoretically could deploy the alternative 20% to growth, which then means we should think about taking some risk. Okay. So beyond time horizon is risk. And how I view risk is the following. We invest $1,000 in an account. Okay. And it's worth $900 the next day. Most people would not like that. Yeah. Right? But if they, can't need, if they don't need the money for 30 years, it's okay. Because what goes down will come up. Okay. Alternatively, the third thing to think about is opposite of risk is inflation. So if we don't subject ourselves to letting money go up and down mm -hmm. and it stagnates in the bank, yeah. inflation is eroding our purchasing power because things we purchase today are going to cost more money in 10, 20, That's 30 good years. To know. So the opposite of risk is inflation. Mm. And I think both of them should be measured in planning. That's good. And so I'm glad you brought up inflation because, you know, it's something that typically we like to talk to our Money Monday audience about because we want to make sure that whatever investments that they're looking into, it outpaces inflation. Make sure it's outpacing inflation. So we know that right now inflation is what? About 2%, close 2 to 3%, right in that mark. So of course, if there's an investment that you're looking at investing in and it's maybe 3% or less, then ultimately we're netting out at a what? 1%? So make sure that you're also outplacing inflation with whatever investments that you're looking into. Would you recommend that? Yes, and also think about this. If the bank is paying you zero, and the cost of living is 3% per year, your bank is losing 3% of your value annually. That's another way to look at it. Another thing I would share regarding inflation, when I went to college, it cost X. In my mind, if that's the number that I'm using, when my eight-year-old goes to college, I've forgotten about inflation. Things will be more expensive yeah. down the road. So we have to remember that inflation exists, but it's silent. Mm -hmm. We have to be aware of that. That's good to know. And so when that person's saving that 20% that we talked about, if it's sitting in a bank account, and of course we know that it's not generating any revenue or any profits at all, then what would you recommend as another savings vehicle other than a traditional savings account? Well, I think there's value and merit in having money accessible within 24 hours. Okay. So despite it doesn't offer us much interest, this Money Mondays isn't negative regarding banking. Banking is positive. Of course. But remembering, you're right, your question. There are alternatives like certificates of deposits, CDs, or money markets that might pay two to four percent interest. That's good to and know. And be available in three month increments or six months or nine months. That makes a big difference over 10 or 20 years if you didn't have an emergency. That's good to know. So we know that you've helped many people. Can you tell us of any success stories? Oh, there's so many. What's interesting is when I came in the profession 25 years ago, I undervalued the impact and relationships I built. I thought it was about money and finance. I so underestimated it and was not mature enough to recognize. Yeah. It's about helping people. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, one of the stories that I'll share is a couple that I met close to 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they recently sent me a note when they watched their daughter walk across stage for a college graduation. Awesome. And when I remember sitting with them, she was less than one. And I asked them the feeling they wanted to have when they watched her graduate and wow. walk. And what they told me, and I vividly recall, Jill, is I want to feel like we've put her in position to be successful okay. and not have to take employment to make a certain amount of money. That's good. I think what's interesting now looking back on this with the text that I received is we watched her graduate, 
cried and thought about you. And that's Aww. interesting because she went into a field now of a nonprofit where she's not making a lot of money working in New York City. So the essence that she was able to do that stems from the parents' discipline and saving and sacrifice so she could chase her dreams in the most expensive city in America in a field where she's not going to make much money. She's able to do that more because of her own will and willingness to work hard than anything. Mm. But I do know an ingredient in making that work is that she doesn't have school loans. That's good. That's an ingredient, right? Yes. So it's maybe 2% of the reason. She's the rest is her own reason she'll be successful. But that makes me feel good. And so there may be a business owner that may be watching. What should they be considering when thinking about the financial planning process? Oh, there's so many things because they've already chosen to wear two hats in life for their personal life and professional. So I think the trust in planners and professional teammates mm -hmm. is even more critical because they have less time to do these things on their own Yeah. because the business owner doesn't punch in and punch out. Yeah. It's part of life. The second thing I think of is being able to find a team of experts okay. to help them, a planner, an accountant, et cetera. Okay. And that team has to communicate and the team should become the quarterback. If that quarterback role is given to the client who owns mm -hmm. a business, it's difficult for them to concentrate on their business as it is and focus. That quarterback role needs to be given to the planner or the accountant or attorney okay. to make sure that that business owner is cared for moving forward as they grow. That's good to know. You know, Tom, you've given such great information. I'm sure that there are people out there that want to contact you and maybe want a relationship similar to ours. I'm grateful for you. Thank you. I, I might add that. But can you tell people, how can they contact you? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you. And I appreciate this opportunity. It's a blessing to have a friend like Jill and the organization that supports your mission to help you be more well informed about money. The second thing I think is critical is there are many advisors. And I know you asked. My website's simple. It's my name. T-O-M-C-A-N-A-L-E, TomCanale.com. I think the most important thing is you obtain a referral. Again, do your research and find someone with credentials that say CFP. They have the top level of education in the field, and then you still have to trust them. Yeah. So don't forget to trust your gut because it's probably what got you to where you are today. That's good to know. So Money Monday audience, we want to thank you guys for tuning in today for our segment on the financial planning and wealth management process. For those of you who are watching, be sure to tune into our next segment as we will continue on talking about insurance. And thank you for tuning in our Money Monday audience. We look forward to seeing you prosper. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions in advance to moneymondays at jbs.edu. Again, that's moneymondays at jbs.edu. Don't forget to join us every first and third Monday at noon for a new money topic on money management and wealth creation. Subscribe to our JBS YouTube channel. And as always, I'm your host, Jill Thompson, and I look forward to seeing you prosper.